Hi everyone, uh, we're here for one more video on Physics 144. Uh, today we're discussing the principles of special relativity, except this time we're turning our attention to the last part of the course, namely dynamics. Uh, in the previous video, we studied how, under relativity, things uh, moved. We discovered that time and space were relative, and our interpretations of them uh, depended on the observer and their uh, different frames of reference. Uh, today, we'll just fill out a few of the points about what this means for the rest of the things we've been thinking about in this course, namely uh, forces, momentum, energy and sort of talk about how to solve a few uh, basic problems in the context of relativity. So uh, let's get started. And I want to start out with the idea of relativistic momentum. Um, and this is an idea that uh, it shows up because it's a good way to kind of approach the problem. Specifically, the problems involving uh, how particles are going to interact. So let's think about solving something in the context of relativity using the ideas of classical momentum. So we're going to consider a basic idea of a head-on, perfectly inelastic collision between two particles of equal mass. We kind of know how this problem works. These two things will splat into each other, and their initial momentum as a vector would add up to be zero, so their final momentum would then end up being zero. Uh, let's consider this idea now, except in the context of relativity. So previously we were thinking about things in relativity, and we wanted to identify things that different observers would agree on. So let's consider this exact same collision, but assume that it's relativistic. And what that means is that suddenly, when we write down just this classical version of momentum here, mv times mv, we have to compare what we expect for uh, the momentum uh, for this problem uh, in terms of different reference frames. So let's think about what we would see in a relativistic collision where we were moving along with this particle here. So then this lab frame uh, would be moving along with a momentum uh, or a speed of v. And if we then apply our velocity addition formula, we would expect that this first particle here would then kind of be at rest in our frame. So we would then stick in our uh, uh, relative stick velocity addition formula. We'd pick v for u1. We'd subtract off the lab frame velocity. And oh, sure enough, zero. It's good. Everything's great. So then we have to think about what happens with the oncoming particle that's moving towards us with a speed of v, uh, or I guess 2v in the in the lab frame. If we're now moving with this particle, this one's coming towards us, and we have to count a relativistic effects. So there, the relativistic uh, um, uh, velocity addition formula says we stuck in u2. u2 is negative v. And so we'd see that it would come towards us as negative 2v. So far, so good. But then we have a uh, extra little term down here, which is the 1 plus uh, v squared over c squared. That's going to cause problems. So then let's think about what happens that as this is moving along and we splat together and those particles come to rest, well, they're going to have in our velocity addition frame, their final speed was zero in the original frame. And so it's zero uh, there. And uh, we plug in uh, the denominator there and we just get that it's moving backwards at minus v. So that's fantastic. Uh, everything's good. Uh, we have our initial speed of the particle coming in and our outgoing speed if we're moving along with this particle here. But then let's consider the momentum of these two particles in this moving frame. Uh, so we would say that this is m1 times u1, and I should add some primes here just to be completely copacetic. Uh, and we would say, okay, that's m1 times u1 prime. Well, we calculated u1 prime as zero. And u2 prime is minus 2mv uh, plus v squared over c squared, where we've just taken this and multiplied it by m. And then we add them together. And we get an expression that looks like that. But then we also compare that to the final momentum with an expression that looks like the minus 2mp. 
these are not the same expression. Uh, so if we just use our classical momentum of P equals MV, we do not get something that transforms well under relativity. Uh, so it depending on uh, the momentum's not conserved in one of these frames. So this isn't a good physical quantity. It's not a great conservation law. So we need something else. Well, that something else is to take the original vector momentum and tack a gamma on it. So we say that P is just mv or mu in this case. We're going to avoid v for actual particles moving uh, and save that just for reference frames. So mu uh, is momentum. And then we just stick a 1 minus uh, the total speed squared over c squared. Uh, so we get an expression of gamma mu. And this turns out to be the right momentum. Uh, for here, and we can do conservations, and it is literally 20 minutes of the most riveting algebra you've ever seen, but I'm going to just uh, suppress that for right now in the video, and we'll kind of uh, consider and say that this momentum ends up being conserved between uh, different reference frames. So uh, we just need to stick a gamma on it. Uh, note that if the uh, speed of the particle is much less than c, then this term here is uh, very small, and so we just get 1 in the denominator. The gamma factor goes to 1, and we just get back to our original momentum. So that's one of our basic requirements in anything that we do, so that's good. I just kind of want to illustrate that as the momentum uh, is increasing, uh, as, you, uh, as u gets close to c, so this u over c term goes to 1, we move from tracking the classical momentum, which would just normally just rise, you know, so the momentum here should track linearly with the speed. Uh, for a while. Uh, but then, that if we consider the classical momentum keep going, the relativistic momentum just rises up again asymptotically towards infinity as u approaches c. So this shows us that our momentum gets larger and larger and larger as the particle gets closer and closer to c. Okay, so then we know momentum, we know Newton's second law, so we can talk about forces. Because forces, uh, F, are just dp by dt, uh, and we just take time derivative of it. And first we want to consider u going parallel to uh, the force. So forces acting in the same direction as the velocity, so these should accelerate or decelerate forces. And in that case, the parallel component of the force is d by dt, of uh, mu times 1 minus u squared over c squared. And this is important to separate because we actually care about the time derivative of that u down there in the bottom. So if we're acting parallel to the force, we need to consider ourselves with the u in the top and the u inside the radical changing. So now, just a bit of calculus. So this is a chain rule. Uh, the first thing we do is we have the 1 minus u squared over c squared root, square root. We leave the denominator alone. We take the derivative of the numerator, which gives us this du by dt term. Then we take the derivative of the denominator, leaving the numerator alone. And this is a uh, power law that we have to apply the chain rule to. So we bring down a minus 1 half. That's right there. Uh, the power then goes to minus 3 halves. And then we have to take a derivative of whatever's inside the brackets here. Uh, the 1 doesn't matter. So we then take the derivative of minus u squared over c squared. Uh, and then we get the same term again. Uh, the u squared becomes a 2u when I take the derivative of it. And then there's a du by dt. So all's good up to here, and we'll notice that both terms here, I'm going to sort of factor out a 1 minus u squared over c squared to the negative 3 halves power. We'll pop that out front, and then I get what's left is a 1 minus u squared c squared in the top times du by dt plus u squared plus c squared times du by dt, and you'll notice that these are the same except they have opposite signs, so they cancel out and we're just left with a 1 times du by dt. Uh, we'll call that an acceleration, and so we get ma uh, inside the brackets, or that's a, this is an m out front, and then we get something that is gamma 
to the third power out front. So this tells us that the parallel force uh, it goes like gamma cubed times mass times acceleration. So this tells us how much we get in terms of uh, acceleration for a given force why well, it scales with that gamma cubed in there. That's great. Now we can consider parallel to uh, the or perpendicular to the force and in this case that u in the denominator doesn't change where this is like circular motion uh, these are the normal accelerations so these change the direction but they don't actually change the speed uh, which means I don't have to worry about the denominator or the power of u inside gamma. That's just the constant. So then we just take the time derivative of it and we get gamma ma. So this is weird because the parallel component of the forces leads to different kinds of acceleration, whereas the perpendicular uh, would give us just a vector acceleration uh, perpendicular to it with just a single gamma. So, uh, now we know forces. Oh, pretty great in terms of accelerations. Next, I want to talk about and pay attention to this acceleration, which I'm going to rewrite in for the parallel case as f over gamma m cubed, or gamma cubed m. So this is basically dividing through solving for the acceleration. And if we plug that in uh, for the gamma cubed, we get this 1 minus u squared over c squared term raised to the 3 halves power. And I kind of want to note that this force, like if it's a constant or something like that, the acceleration that you get from that force is actually going to drop as we approach the speed of light. And so this term here is going to cause the acceleration from that to get, uh, uh, to get lower and lower. And this behavior ends up kind of sapping out the effectiveness of forces as you approach the speed of light. So that you, no matter how hard you're pushing on an object, this gamma term just keeps getting larger and larger as you approach C. And so you'll never actually accelerate past C or even to the speed of light if this is a massive object. So you will never reach it there just because the acceleration gets kind of sapped out of it by this uh, extra gamma cubed term that the momentum is dilating. Now, I want you to also be very careful. The mass is not changing, but the momentum is picking up this gamma term. So it's sort of weird. Uh, some books, like your book, introduce the idea of relativistic mass. That is a conceptually challenging lie, and you should ignore and not actually uh, think about that at all. Just remember that the momentum and the forces are getting larger. That covers forces. Now let's talk about work uh, and energy. Now, relativistic work uh, is the idea that we can just uh, integrate a force uh, here, just considering one dimension, uh, over a path. And that will give us our kinetic energy. So this work energy theorem, and we'll generally start from rest, is what we'll use to actually calculate out and think about what kind of energy do we get out if we apply a force to an object? What's the expression that we get uh, for the uh, resulting kinetic energy? And so this will give us an idea of what is the proper energy to use in relativity. So let's get started. Let's just take f uh, integral of f dx. We know what the force is. Again, we'll operate in the parallel uh, aligned velocity and force vectors, so just one dimensional. We stick in our gamma cubed ma, that's right here, uh, times dx. And then we'll apply our usual uh, chain rule trick to rewrite du by dt as du by dx times dx by dt times dx. And the du by dx times dx just reduces to du, and then this dx, chain rule style, reduces to m times u, so the dx by dt becomes u. So this is gamma cubed mu du. That's great. Completely integral. Uh, we can change our variables so that the we're going from zero to whatever our final speed is. Everything's good, and then we just integrate it. And normally we get like one half mu squared out of this, except that gamma there contains a u, so we have to pay attention to that. Well, when we do that, we just insert the expression for the gamma as 1 over 1 minus u squared c squared raised to the 3 halves power, 
and then we apply a substitution. Normally we'd do a u substitution, but that's the variable, and so we're going to do a w substitution instead. And so the w substitution is that we'll just say that w is 1 minus u squared uh, over c squared. And we'll take the derivative of that to get 2u over c squared du, and there's a negative sign, the 1 goes away. And you'll notice that uh, I can rewrite the uh, expression here to say that c squared times dw negative 2 is equal to u times du, and that shows up right here. So then I get uh, the dw uh, comes in, and then I pull out the m and the negative c squared over 2 from over here, uh, pop those out, and I get a 1 uh, over uh, w to the 3 halves power uh, as the result. And then, of course, since I change variables, I have to change bounds. And so the 0 I stick in here, and I get 1 minus 0, and so that becomes a 1. And then I stick in the uf over here in my substitution, and that goes to 1 minus u, uh, u final squared over c squared. This, this is an integral. I could integrate that all day long. Um, and that gives us the minus 1 half, picks up the minus 1 half from here, so we get w to the minus 1 half. And then when we substitute everything in, we get mc squared times uh, something that looks like a gamma, uh, minus 1. So mc squared times gamma minus 1. Okay, so we get uh, that, uh, writing that out, there it is, gamma, MC, gamma minus 1 times mc squared. And this works. So if u is much, much less than c, this expression expands to 1 plus a half u squared over c squared. That's from the binomial theorem that says that 1 plus x to the n is approximately equal to 1 plus nx plus a bunch of higher order terms, which are going to be small because u is much less than c. That's cool uh, because this 1 half here, 1 half u squared over c squared, let's stick that all in. And so we get 1 plus a half u squared over c squared minus 1. Uh, the c squareds cancel out, and I get 1 half of u squared. Once again, we've got a relativistic expression that will reduce to the non-relativistic version as long as we are not close to the speed of light. So this is looking good. Uh, everything's just falling out of that definition of momentum. Uh, everything's coming together here. So finally, uh, let's think about how to actually do some of these applications here. So I'm going to, let's do an example here. Um, if we have a particle and it, we're going to do uh, 4.5 times 10 to the 16 joules of work on it, and we're going to do that work on a one kilogram object, how fast will it be traveling? And I picked this expression because if we just stuck in one half m c squared, uh, so one half times one kilogram times three times 10 to the eight meters per second squared, that would give us 4.5 times 10 to the 16 joules. So if there was no uh, energy or there was no relativity, we'd be traveling at c. But there is relativity. So we know that the kinetic energy of this particle, k, is equal to gamma minus 1 times the mass of the object c squared. So what I'll do is I will solve this expression for gamma. So we get k over mc squared is equal to gamma minus 1. And from there, we know that gamma is going to be 1 plus k over mc squared. And then this is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. And I'm going to use the notation that beta is v over c, just to get things in terms of um, speed of light. And then I'm going to solve for beta. So we'll uh, first square both sides. So we get 1 plus k over mc squared is equal to 1 over 1 minus beta squared. We'll flip both sides. So we get 1 over 1 plus k mc squared is equal to 1 minus beta squared. Uh, solve for beta. So beta is equal to 1 minus 
1 over 1 plus k over mc squared. That's beta squared. Pop on up here. And beta must be 1 minus 1 over 1 plus k over mc squared, all to the 1 half power. So we have uh, k. Well, we, we just figured out that the kinetic energy here is 1 half mc squared. So we can divide by mc squared. So this is 1 minus 1 over 1 plus a half mc squared over mc squared, known to all my favorite people as a half. So that's 1 minus 1 plus 1 plus a half. So that bottom becomes a 3 halves. Flip it, becomes a 2 thirds. So this becomes all for the 1 third, 1 half. It's equal to 1 minus 2 thirds to the 1 half, uh, or the square root of 1 third, which is 0 0.58. And so that means that V is 0.58 C. Okay, so we can put all of the energy uh, that would normally require or non-relativistically require to accelerate something to the speed of light in, and it will only reach about 60% the speed of light. It's kind of a bummer, but that's uh, what we get out of relativity. All right. So the last thing we want to sort of introduce here is the idea of relativistic energy. We've got a good definition of momentum. We sort of understand how it relates to forces and everything. And so now we're going to write down the total energy of the particle. And we're just going to say that that is equal to gamma times mc squared. And this is like the momentum, what you write down, and it behaves well and conserves well under uh, different uh, under different collisions and interactions, except it works in all possible reference frames. So here we'll note that the energy can be split up into gamma minus one mc squared plus mc squared. And we identified this term as the kinetic energy. And then there's this extra little bit of energy here called mc squared. It's not really extra a lot. This little bit here is called the rest mass energy of an object. And that's required to actually have conservation of energy work in different relativistic frames. So this idea of introducing that gives us the, uh, it gives us this, uh, the ability to actually do relativity here. And you'll notice that if k is equal to zero, then you get down to an expression that looks perhaps familiar. E equals mc squared. So this is where it actually is useful. So now, given the fact that we have just introduced e equals mc squared, or an even better version of it, namely E equals gamma mc squared, then we can consider uh, the final really useful quantity here, which is that E squared minus p squared c squared uh, has a value that is invariant across all observers. So I just stick in here that e squared is gamma squared m squared c to the fourth. That's just squaring that expression. And then I put in my expression for uh, the momentum, which is gamma mu, and then we square it. So we get gamma squared m squared u squared times this c squared. So there's the c squared. And then we'll factor out this gamma squared m squared c to the fourth from both, and we're left with a 1 minus u squared over c squared, uh, which is 1 over gamma squared, cancel, cancel, and we're left with m squared c to the fourth, where m is what we call the rest mass of the object and c to the fourth. So this says that no matter what, for any observer, we have e squared minus p squared c squared equal to a fixed constant. And this is, for deeply related reasons, like the interval, which was c squared delta t squared minus x squared delta x squared, was invariant for all observers. So this is something that we'll use that no matter what in a, uh, what there is in a problem, uh, we know that e squared minus p squared c squared 
is going to always give us a constant value that's the rest mass times c to the fourth. Okay. If I push that m squared c to the fourth over to the other side of the equation, we arrive at one of the most important equations in uh, class in relativistic physics, which says that the energy of a particle squared is just p squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth. If v or if the speed of the particle is zero, then you just get that reducing to e equals m c squared. So if you're going to have a formula sheet, write this down on it. Just say, okay. That's the end of the physics. Let's do some examples. And in those examples, it's actually, usually we run into these in terms of the uh, particle physics. So this is where it shows up because these are the only things that we have massive objects that are getting up close to the speed of light. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually relate particles to their rest mass energies. And we're actually going to write down everything in terms of energies. And to turn that into a mass, we divide it by C squared. And to turn it into a momentum, we just divide it by C. So uh, a proton has a mass of 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Or I'm going to write that as 938 mega electron volts, MeV, over C squared. And an electron has 0.511 mega electron volts over C squared, where an electron volt is just this unit of energy, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. It's the amount of energy an electron carries after being accelerated through a potential difference of one volt. You get this much energy. And uh, that MeV unit turns out to be pretty convenient for what we're dealing with here. And finally, I'll note that photons uh, are particles and they have no rest mass energy, uh, but it carries momentum E equals P times C. So that's just E squared is equal to M squared C to the fourth plus P squared C squared, except there is no rest mass energy. That's zero. This actually has the consequence that anything that can travel at the speed of light also has zero rest mass energy. These are the only things that, that we can actually get moving at the speed of light. They cannot have any rest mass energy. Okay, so let's actually do some problems using our newfound tools of dynamics. So let's consider this one. Uh, a particle of mass m is moving along the plus x axis with a velocity of u. So it's just coming along here, sailing along, it has a mass m and a speed u, and then we have a second particle coming here with a mass of m over 3 and a speed of minus u. So these are very useful expressions because uh, since their speeds are the same, we know that the gamma factors for the two particles are the same. Therefore, I can write down what the momentum and the energies of these particles are. So I'm going to do that by just noting that the final momentum, uh, P final, as a vector, is going to be the sum of the initial momentum. We'll call this one particle 1 and this one's particle 2. So this is just equal to P1 plus P2. And it doesn't matter what frame I'm working in because of the concert, the momentum is uh, transforms well in relativity. I haven't proved that. Not going to but it does. And so we can see that this uh, momentum is just going to be equal to uh, gamma times m1 times u. And then we get the particle heading back in the other way. Still a vector is momentum. Uh, so that is gamma times m2 times u. And we know that m2 is the mass of the first one over 3. So this becomes two-thirds m u gamma. So that gives us the total momentum of whatever particle is being formed. It must be carrying that momentum. Next, we know that the energy of the system is conserved, but it's the relativistic energy. So we know that E1 is equal to uh, E1 
is going to be equal to gamma times mc squared for the first particle, same gamma, and E2 is just equal to gamma times m over 3c squared for the second particle. And if I add those together, we get E1 plus E2, then we get 4 thirds gamma mc squared. So now we have the energy and the momentum of the final particle. So then I can use my relationship that E squared minus P squared C squared is equal to M squared C to the fourth. And I'll stick in my expressions for E and P. So let's just rewrite that on the other side. We'll flip it around. Stick in my value for E which is going to be 4 thirds gamma mc squared squared uh, minus uh, whatever the momentum is, which is 2 thirds mu gamma times uh, squared times c squared. And so then I can uh, collect some values here, m squared c to the fourth. Uh, looks like everything, ha well, I'll we'll, we'll just expand this. So 16 ninths gamma squared uh, little m uh, squared c to the fourth minus 4 ninths uh, times little m squared u squared gamma squared c squared. From here, I'll just do a little bit of factoring. So we'll pull out a gamma squared and an m squared. So we'll get gamma squared m squared times, and we'll pull out the c to the fourth as well, because we're, we're wild that way, just wild. So we get 16 ninths minus 4 ninths. Uh, everything's come out except for the u squared over c squared. And so then we'll cancel out the c to the fourths on both sides and take a square root. So that means I'll cancel this c to the fourth with that c to the fourth. And we will arrive at the mass of the particle is equal to the, uh, the mass of the final particle is equal to the original particle mass times the square root of 16 ninths minus 4 ninths times u squared over c squared to the one-half power. And you'll notice that if u is much, much less than c, and this second term here drops out, this becomes the square root of 16 ninths, which is equal to uh, 4 thirds. So m is equal to 4 thirds m if u is less, less c. Which makes sense because we have a particle of mass m sticking to a particle of mass m over 3. So that becomes 4 thirds. But if it's relativistic, the resulting mass actually loses some of the mass because it gets sucked up into the relativistic momentum of the particles. All right, next one. Uh, we have an electron. Imagine an electron moving along with a kinetic energy of one mega electron volt. Uh, it makes a head-on collision with a positron at rest. Now, a positron is an antiparticle for an electron. It's antimatter. So when they collide, they turn into photons. The two annihilate each other. They produce a pair of gamma ray photons of equal energy, and they travel at equal angles theta with respect to the original direction. So uh, electron splats into positron, outcome two gammas, and they are angled at a uh, angle theta. What we'd like to do is find the energy, momentum, and angle of emission of these gamma rays. So we can just conserve some energy and some momentum. Okay, there are two uh, energy, uh, two, well, let's just write down the initial energy. The initial energy of this system is equal to the mass energy of an electron times c squared plus the kinetic energy, which is specified in the problem, and that's for the electron, plus the mass energy of a positron sitting at rest with zero kinetic energy. They have the same mass as the electron, so I'll just carry through that mec squared, and so we get 2mec squared plus k as the initial energy and we can go and look up what those values are if we needed to. But critically, that's also 
the final energy coming out of this reaction and it gets split over these two photons. Moreover, those photons each carry energy of PC, so PC. Uh, so P is the momentum of the photon and C is the speed of light. So we now know the total momentum and energy of the photons. So let's uh, figure it out. So the energy is equal to energy of one photon. Uh, whoops, let's do E of one photon is the final energy in the reaction divided by two. And that's equal to two times 0 0.511 MeV over C squared times C squared plus 1.000 MeV. All over two. And this gives us an answer that is 1.011 mega electron volts. So great, figured out the energy. Uh, we know that those photons each carry momentum of 2 uh, P or of equal to PC. So E gamma over C is the momentum of a single photon. And so then that's 1.011 MeV over C. And that's sufficient. That's a momentum unit in relativistic mechanics. So finally, we need to figure out what this angle is. And what we've been doing is we just figured out the momentum vectors for these particles, the magnitude of those momentum vectors. What we need to do is then figure out what the angle is by figuring out one of the components of the vectors. And here we'll use the relativistic momentum. So the relativistic momentum of this situation initially, pi, is equal to gamma times mu, where I don't know what u is, I don't know what gamma is, but I do know what the total kinetic energy is uh, of this uh, uh, of the photon. So uh, we can figure this out by noting that um, we we can figure this out and figure out the gamma in terms of the kinetic energy because we also know that the initial energy is equal to gamma minus one times mc squared. And so if I want to figure out the, oh, sorry, that's the kinetic energy, not the total energy. Oops. Pi, and then this is k is equal to gamma minus one mc squared. And so if I need to figure out the uh, initial x momentum of this uh, photon, I can figure it out in terms of the kinetic energy. So in particular, I know that k over mc squared is equal to gamma minus 1, and therefore gamma is equal to 1 plus k over mc squared. Seen that expression before. And therefore the beta value for this is something else we have solved before. So the beta value for this. Well, let's just, uh, let's write this as gamma is one over the square root of one minus beta squared is equal to one plus k over mec squared. And then we will uh, invert the expression. So flip it, square root of one minus beta squared is equal to one over one plus k over mec squared. Then we'll square it 1 minus beta squared is equal to 1 plus 1 plus k over mec squared. And then uh, we solve for beta. So beta is equal to uh, 1 minus 1 over 1 plus k over mec squared all to the 1 half power. Okay. And so now we can write down the initial momentum of this because we have solved for k, uh, we've solved for gamma, and we have solved for an expression for u in uh, this expression. And we know that this expression is here is also equal to the final momentum. And the final momentum is just the x components of the uh, photon momentum. So we know that, and there's two of them. So this is 2 times Px for the momentum, 
uh, is uh, the initial momentum coming in. 2px x hat. And uh, the y momentum of these cancel out because the angle uh, is the same and one's going up, one's going down. So this gets us everything we need to know. And so if we want to figure out the x component of the momentum, so p sub x is just the initial momentum over 2. And then I have a uh, complicated expression for this, uh, but I can sort of plug in to uh, the expression here and sub in that k is equal to 1.000 MeV. And then we know that MeC squared is half an MeV, 511 MeV. And therefore, this grinds out to find that gamma is equal to 2.96 and beta is equal to 0 0.94. Therefore, uh, the momentum of a photon, P sub x, is equal to gamma 2.96 times 0 0.511 MeV over C times the uh, speed, which is equal to 0 0.94, uh, times C. And so that is equal uh, 0 0.94 times C is the speed. Uh, the momentum is half an MeV over C squared, and that's equal to P, uh, P sub uh, X for the photon. Uh, this all comes out as 0 0.480 MeV over C. And therefore, I can use this as the x component, and then this, 1.011, as the total vector here. And so let's uh, clear some space for that. So remembering the expression here that we have p sub x is equal to 0 0.480 MeV over C. So this is basically a triangle where this is 1.011 MeV. This is the angle we want, and then this is 0 0.480 MeV. I'm oh, sorry, over C. These are over C. And then the angle there we solve as the arc cosine uh, gives a value of 61.6 degrees. Uh, and that's equal to arc cos of 0 0.480 MeV over 1.011 All right, there's, uh, there's the pieces. So, uh, one more example. And this one uh, is the case of an object that's traveling along and disintegrates into two fragments. One fragment has a mass of 1 MeV over C squared and a momentum of 1.75 MeV over C in the x direction, and the other has a mass of 1.5 MeV uh, and a momentum of 2 MeV in the plus y direction. So the scenario is that we have one going up here and one uh, object going here. So we know that the incoming, the outgoing momentum must look something like this. And so that had to equal the incoming momentum. So this object came in at an angle and then split into two objects that are moving at uh, relatives, uh, at sort of perpendicular uh, directions. So we do know that the original momentum of this object is equal to the final momentum of this object and that's just equal to the values that are given in the problem. So that's 1.75 MeV over C in the I hat direction plus 2 MeV over C in the J hat direction. Uh, so from there, we can also figure out what the total energy of the particle is uh, coming in. So this is my original momentum and my original, uh, or to figure out the rest mass energy, we're going to use that E squared minus P squared C squared 
is equal to m squared c to the fourth. And so this is how we'll figure out the rest mass uh, energy of the object that originally came in. We have already figured out what the momentum is, and so we can figure out its magnitude and stick it in there. Now we just have to figure out what the total energy in this reaction is. Well, fortunately, we've got an expression for that. We know that the energy of an individual object, E1 squared, is going to be P1 squared C squared plus M1 squared C to the fourth. And then E2 squared is going to look just like that. P2 squared C squared plus M2 squared C to the fourth. And we've got everything we need to plug into these expressions in the problem. So then E1 squared plus E2 squared is going to be equal to um, E1 squared plus E2 squared is just the P1 squared C squared, which is right here. So that's... Uh, 1.75 MeV squared plus M1C to the fourth, which is 1.00 MeV squared plus uh, P2 squared, which is right here. So that's 2.00 MeV squared plus, notice the C's are all canceling out. And then uh, the, oops, this is, uh, except uh, that's not the momentum. That's the momentum. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we add the mass energy. So that's the M2C to the four. M2 squared C to the fourth is 1.50 MeV quantity squared. And we add all of those up and we get that the uh, total energy is uh, 10 point, I believe, 3 uh, MeV, or the final energy is equal to uh, 3.21 MeV. So from there, we can figure out the rest mass energy of the situation, uh, because we know that it's E squared minus P squared C squared is M squared C to the fourth. So that's, uh, we already have the E squared. We figure that out uh, over here. We have the p squared and the c squared, so we get to take this out, and so we say that e squared minus p squared c, p squared c squared, uh, and because they're perpendicular to each other, we just end up subtracting off, uh, well, let's see here, it's 1.75 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 1.5 squared. So this is just the energy. I rewrote it. I've pulled out the MeVs uh, minus the X component, which is the 1.75. Again, that shows up as squared minus the Y component, 2.00 squared. And so these cancel with those, and we are left with an answer of... Um, we are left with an answer that is um, one, let's see here, it is e, uh, sorry, this is m squared c to the fourth. So m squared c to the fourth is equal to uh, 3.25 uh, MeV squared uh, times uh, c to the fourth. Oh, sorry, just MeV squared. And then if we take the we divide through by the c to the fourth and take the square root, we just get that the mass is equal to 1.80 MeV over c squared, which is part one of the problem. We figured out the mass. And then from here, we need to figure out the, um, we need to figure out the resulting momentum of this. And so the magnitude of the original momentum uh, we just solve as the square root of the 1.75 MeV over C squared plus 2.00 MeV over C squared. And that gets us that this is equal to uh, 2.66 MeV over C. 
And this, of course, is equal to gamma times m times u, where we already know what m is. And from here, we can solve for u uh, by uh, just sticking in uh, the different numbers that we need. So we'll divide through and we'll take, oops, we'll take pi, magnitude of the initial momentum over m is equal to gamma times u. And this has a value of 1.476 uh, times, uh, we'll cancel out the mass. And so 1.476 over, uh, or 1.476 times c. And from here, we just write out the expression that that's u over the square root of 1 minus u uh, squared over c squared to go to 1.476. And from there, I can square it and invert and find out that v is equal to 0 0.561 times the speed of light, 0 0.476c. All right, so that gives us the tools that we need to solve uh, these uh, different problems. In On average, we are conserving uh, momentum and energy separately, and then we get this additional little factoid that we can just figure out the rest mass of a particle uh, by the difference of e squared minus p squared c squared will always give me that rest mass invariant. So this brings us to the end of relativistic dynamics and indeed to the end of the videos for this course. Uh, so with all of that, we've seen kind of the grand sweep of Newtonian mechanics all the way into much more modern physics that we apply in particle accelerators. Uh, so thanks for coming along on the ride and I will see you all later.